All right, here's another video from Annie News called A Reaser Recap. Everything you need to do for season three. I think this is just season one content. Now, we've been coming off of the fattest two month ReZero marathon. So everything is fresh in my head, but hey, I'm always down to learn more. With eight years having passed since ReZero season one, eight I years, figure man. some of you might be looking for a little recap. Hell yeah. Well, look no further than here since this is all the important stuff that. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I do not need a recap, nor do I want to recap. All I want to do is make more videos and make more money off of it. And I know that ReZero is a very popular topic, so I'm gonna farm it. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you, man. <laughs> I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm here to get the bag. That happened in it. All the main events to jog your memory and a special focus on everything you're going to want to know for Season 3. Regulus! Let's jump right into it. Yo, this is some Season 3 teaser uh, looking uh, uh, scene, right? But like, yo, Regulus! Season 3. Let's jump right into it. Yeah. Okay. This is Subaru. An isekai protect. I cannot believe that this pose, it started off so stupid, so cringe. Then later on in season two with the trials, that pose is done again. But this time it's like endearing as he's kind of like owning up to his mistakes and what that pose represented. And then that pose being shown in the straight bet moments. Sorry, not, I don't think it was really the straight bet moment. Was it straight bet? It might have been. It's the one where Roswell and Subaru is talking and Subaru just this shit. That was the coolest pose I've ever seen when he did that. And I hope in season three, when the war breaks out, like he does this to start the war. Like that'd be so hype, so funny to me. There should be a statue in Lugunica with this pose. This kid has performed miracles for this kingdom clearing out the white whale that this kingdom has not been able to defeat for like centuries same with the fucking rabbit they need to literally build a statue of natsuki subaru doing this pose an isekai protagonist without all the things that usually makes someone an isekai protagonist he has no powers no special privileges and no allies and simply appears in a new world with the clothes on his back and a smartphone a very interesting thing we really think about is during this first run does he have the authority of envy returned by death and we're still thinking that that authority is borrowed by from satala i still think that he's using it as a proxy somehow but does he have it at this point or does he get it at the loot seller right when he dies in this run i think that he gets it when he dies in this run and a pact is made at that time and we forget memories Unfortunately, it's not as forgiving of a world as a certain other smartphone isekai as the first people Subaru comes across. And the craziest lore drop within these kids? Alright, here's the funniest shit. This mushroom-haired guy, he has a divine protection called like, I forget what it's called, but basically he's good in bed. It might be a funny thing because maybe he doesn't get bitches and therefore his divine protection will never be used, but he's really good in bed. <laughs> this guy in the middle? is the son of, I think, a guy named Rickert, who we saw in the role selection, where he called, uh, he had a little mustache. He also showed up in Beak with it in library. Also, he called Felt to Sewer Rat and Amelia, like a half devil, I don't know, un uneducated. And I still think that he was completely correct. I think that he's one of the few logical person thinking about how we shouldn't be picking random fucking girls off of a random stone, but pick the people that's fit to rule. And this guy on the right, I don't really know much lore about them, but I do know that these three are kind of important for the future as they kind of like join on with Felt, right? Cross our thugs. Fortunately, he's saved by our heroine, Amelia, but that's only because she was chasing after the person who stole her. Another crazy lore drop. I forgot, I forgot, I forgot. These dudes, they have canonically, lore accurately, this is not even bullshit. They've, they've clashed against the strongest beings of the ReZero world. Maybe not all the strongest, but they, they clashed against Reinhardt, quote-unquote clashed, survived, right? <laughs> Reinhardt himself says, I would have never been able to defeat them if it wasn't for Subaru here. I know he's capping, but, you know, <laughs> he quote-unquote clashed. And there's another dude from the Valachian Empire, which is a southern continent, where some of the strong people there also showed up, and they fucked these three up, but they survived. Like, like these three have now clashed against, like... Two of the strongest beings in the ReZero world, and they're still at it. Like, it's kind of crazy to think about this. Subaru comes across our thugs. Fortunately, he's saved by our heroine, Amelia, but that's only because she was chasing after the person who stole her insignia, Felt. Why is this insignia important? Well, it confirms Amelia's candidacy in the royal Chosen selection. One. 
Glory a three-year-long event that determines the next ruler of Lagunica. This is a powerful position more than one faction is currently vying for, so it's important Amelia secures her insignia to continue her candidacy. Mm -hmm. The other factions are going to be important to Season 3 Yo, too, but- What is this black feathers? Also, Priscilla has another attendant. A pink hair Shoda? I don't know about that. But black feathers falling down. That's not a good sign. Uh-oh. ...to season 3 too, but that's something that I'll talk about more towards the end of the video. Mimi TV! Uh, Hetaro, Ricardo, Julius, Anastasia. Yo. For now, let's keep the focus- Yo, whose black feathers are these? What the hell? The whole fucking- This is like a Pristella, right? The city that is like literally uh, right in the middle of the map, and then, and then the borders are Lugunica and Kararagi. But like, what the hell is happening? Crow feathers, but like, what? This is looking pretty bad. For now, let's keep the focus on Amelia. Alright. So, it's here she introduces herself as Satella, Satella. which, as we know, carries quite a bit of negative connotation with That's it. That's right. Reason being that it's the same name as the Witch of Envy. But one important thing is that the Witch of Envy and Satella are two separate quote-unquote personalities. Satella is not compatible with a certain witch factor, if not multiple, I don't know. And the Witch of Envy and Satala are two separate beings. A widely feared being known to have caused quite a bit of calamity in the world. Subaru and Amelia then continue their search for her stolen insignia, end up in the slums where they come across Old Man Rom's loot Rom house, G. then both meet a grisly death at the hands of an unknown assailant. And at this point, I believe at this point is when Subaru gets uh, returned by death. I think that he also makes some kind of pact. I, I, and... and I'm not sure if it's as simple as his memories being erased when he makes like a quote-unquote oath vow pact contract with Satala or whatever, but there's also a lot of weird scenes where seemingly Subaru has saved Satala a lot. So like there might be a lot of memories that just forgotten, but I think that this point is when we get the powers. It's from here that Subaru discovers he can return by death, and his first trial with it is to recover the insignia. Mm -hmm. The reason I say trial is because as we find out in season two, this was a legitimate trial Roswell himself created. That's right, Roswell hired Elsa, right, to get that insignia because to his grimoire, it's probably stated that if you do this shit, a Japanese neat will show up and just solve your problems, Roswell, and he's like, really? Bet, I'll try it. Setting that aside for now, though, Subaru's return by death means that any time he dies, he'll come back to life at a previous unspecified, unpredictable, and uncontrollable save point. That's right. We still don't know exactly how a checkpoint is made. It seems like it's just made after we overcome a significant uh, challenge, right? But it, the rules, it's very... there's no specifics. It's an instant resurrection that occurs immediately at the point of death, one that seemingly has no limit to it. So, this was a power Subaru was forced to get accustomed to as the loot house proved to be rather difficult. Exactly two more deaths difficult. There was one more to Elsa in a deal gone wrong, then once again to the thugs right after. <laughs> and then the thug that accidentally killed him, he didn't even mean to. This is like the first time that middle kid, the runaway son of the noble Rickert, accidentally killed somebody and felt bad about it. So they're literally all just pussies. Those thugs... They're cowards. They've never actually killed before, and he was genuinely scared and ran away. Both loops weren't without their benefits, though, as with each cycle, Subaru was able to learn more about the people involved with the theft. There's Felt the girl who stole the insignia, Rom the old giant acting as her guardian, then... Craziest theory? Romji was involved somehow with the kidnapping of a Lugunikin princess a long time ago who is definitely Felt. And maybe Romji was a head maid or butler and helped Felt escape. I don't fucking know. But uh, I, I think there's something special going on with Romji, man. And the late edition Reinhardt, who might as well be God himself. Lollicon. He's actually the reason Subaru's even able to survive the next loop, as his involvement ensured Subaru's safety, albeit barely. So, with Subaru's actions having a direct impact on Amelia's insignia being returned to her, that was enough to earn Amelia's trust and have her bring the injured Subaru back to the mansion of her bed. And to Amelia though, this is crazy because this kid just shows up out of nowhere in this run. Remember, think of it from like the perspective of different characters in each specific run. Amelia never met Subaru until in the loot cellar and somehow he just knows everything about her. Puck also never talks about this shit, right? 
Subaru talks about Puck in the 9 to 5 and everything, even though they've never met. Puck, Subaru literally calls out to Puck in this run. And even in break time, Emilia and Puck kind of talks about it. So it's kind of weird how that kid just like knew about you, Puck, huh? And Puck's like, yeah, anyway. So it's just like, what the hell is going on? Does Puck know all the secrets? How much does he know? Who knows? Have her bring the injured Subaru back to the mansion of her benefactor. It's here Subaru is eager to prove himself, all while getting acquainted with a brand new cast of characters. So there's Roswell, Lord of House Mathers, and Head Court Mage to Lagunica. Giga Roswell. His two maids, best girl Rem and her sister Ram, then the- the blue girl who was Rem. Rambo, who are you talking about? I cannot believe eight years later, monkeys are still time typing that shit, thinking they're funny. It's just like, bro, are you serious? Like, you're still doing this? You think this is funny? And her sister Ram, then the great spirit of the Forbidden Library, Beatrice. Initially, things seem rather calm at first, but after two sequences of back-to-back -back mysterious deaths, Subaru is led to believe Drill that Lally. there's a threat within the house. The Drill Lally spinning. It was enough to make him leave and try to scope out the mansion from a distance. This revealed the shocking betrayal of Rem. And for some reason, this is the episode that I cried the most. This was the most emotional I've ever gotten in a Re Zero. Episode 7 fucking destroyed me. ...of Rem, commencing the progressive deterioration of Subaru's mental state. Reason being that, just like the cycle of loops before, Subaru had once again used each to become more acquainted with everyone. This made each death increasingly frustrating since to see these people he knew want to kill him out of mistrust, well, that hurt both physically and emotionally. And I think to a narcissist like me, I think that like, this scene hit so hard because it was like self-action being not recognized, the realization that all those efforts in trying to get close with the, you know, Rem and Ram, None of that shit ever mattered. And Rem shows how they really thought. And, and something about that just pierced my soul. This one on episode 23, which was Subaru's most tragic death as he asked Julius and Felix to kill him, right? Those two episodes, because it has to deal with oneself, it just like destroyed me. The other shit, I don't know. Everyone has like, I, I think that when it comes to crying in an anime or any show, it all has to do with how much you can relate to something and whether or not, like, what kind of person you are and what you value. Because of what I value, these scenes impact me the most. And some to some other people, like Rem's Confession, Ram's Confession Season 2, right? Stuff like that, the parent stuff with Subaru, right? Those scenes, people cry for those. And at the end of the day, it's just up to, like, the individuals, like, how much they can, like, relate to something. Increasingly frustrating since to see these people he knew want to kill him out of mistrust, well, that hurt both physically and emotionally. So, Ram kills Subaru up on the mountaintop. Ram tries to kill him after Ram mysteriously dies. I couldn't cry in 15 because of how shocking it was. It was weird. Betrugis' performance was also just a fucking roller coaster of just like bewilderment, and I'm just in shock. And then Ram Twister moment, absolutely just suffering. But I couldn't cry because I was more shocked than disturbed than like sad, I guess. And then the final scene with Puck, you know, saying Nemure, right? It's like sleep with like my daughter. Like that was just like, what just happened? The credit starts rolling. I'm, I'm just like in shock. I, I can't cry. I'm like in shock. As in the next loop, then Subaru has a full on mental breakdown in the loop after that. It all led towards this pivotal moment with Amelia since. And at this point, he falls in love. A lot of people question why is Subaru so in love with Amelia? And a lot of people try to come up with like really objective reasoning and how it makes no sense. And I think it's not supposed to make sense because it's just a stupid degen 17 year old neat that has a bias for silver, el silver haired elves, right? And like the fact that Amelia like saved Subaru in the beginning, no one was there. Amelia's the first one to show up, even if she did not necessarily like feel the same way Subaru did. Subaru saw that her as a savior, the lap pillow. At that point, I think it's a wrap. But a really interesting part is none of this shit matters. As in, these scenes don't really matter, even though it's definitely helpful, because Subaru seemingly is some sort of past lover or reincarnation of a person that Satala once loved. Satala and Mila, a lot of resemblances. Subaru has forgotten all those memories for some reason. The Shadow Garden content, right, when Satala and, and Subaru are talking. It, it, there is a moment, you know, episode 25, the season finale, when the explosion happens and Subaru is in the Shadow Garden moment talking with Satala. But this time, it's like a 
it's like this version of Subaru that has the memories, right? So it, it's feeling like perhaps these affection towards Amelia, it was always there, not because he's a neat that is biased for silver-haired elves, not because of her being the savior or the lamp pillow, but because of the subconscious love, right? The subconscious love that has been forgotten, but kind of seeping out. I, I think that might be what's happening. Since nothing heals quite like a good lap pillow, this was the turning point for Subaru and the true beginning of his journey with the Amelia camp. That being the case, Rem and Ram start to trust him a little bit more, Beatrice becomes more acquainted with the person always invading her library, then the mystery of his first death starts to unravel itself. Bald shaman As dog. it turns out, the curse placed on him was a result of mob beasts, demon-like monsters created by the Witch of Gluttony. Mm -hmm. They were being controlled by Meili, who if you remember- and the craziest part here, Roswell did not hire Mady. Roswell only hired Elsa. In season two, same thing. Elsa was hired. There's another group behind the scenes that's doing this shit. And I don't know who it is, but maybe Mady has the answers because now we've kidnapped her. Remember from season two is a mob beast master. Now. You may think that this too was a trial set up by Roswell, but it's important no. to note it actually wasn't. Yeah, and he knows, knows his details, right? It was a different group that hired Mady there, and then Elsa and Mady was working together. Whoever hired Mady is someone whose identity still remains a secret to us. Who knows, man? And also, the ball spot, that's where the horn used to be for a witch fiend. If you break the horn of a witch fiend, you can control them. And that was like almost, that was kind of very troll for Tape to do this because at this point, when we were trying to figure out who this new beast tamer could be, I couldn't really conf confidently say it was Mady because Mady was controlling- I thought my assumption was Mady was controlling this dog because she broke the horn, and if you break a horn of a witch fiend, you can control them, but no. That was another layer of bait. Mady just inherently has those powers. In any case, it's after this that Subaru and Rem go through that whole bonding experience. With the constant back and forth of life or death situations, that shared conflict led the two of them to become closer. Many people completely forget and cherry pick how Rem tortures Subaru and therefore it's perfectly fine why Subaru rejected Rem. A lot of tiny brain cell people also talk about how Rem rejected Subaru in the confession scene, which wasn't even like a, the, the thing about how like um, let's run away and Rem said no, but then continue to talk about the, their potential future together, right? The if greed route. It's crazy how many people are so deluded to their biases, they're trying to justify, but like none of it is consistent. Like everything is from a place of love. Even if she did torture for sure, what happened here? She literally puts her life in the line because if not, Subaru could die from the curses, right? So she's trying to go kill every witch fiend. Like a lot of people just conveniently just ignore everything that Rem has done to pretty much counteract whatever happened in episode seven. That shared conflict led the two of them to become closer. It's a key relationship that heavily defines both their characters onward, especially in the next arcs of the Royal Selection and the Whale Hunt. I'm not gonna lie to you guys. Arc 3, as an anime only, is still my number one arc. Arc 4 is great. I think that Arc 4 is below Arc 3 for me. Arc 3 showed me that a main character can just be trash and hit rock bottom but still climb all the way up. Like, the things that I witnessed in Arc 3, I, it's just mind-blowingly fucking good. I still think about it. I'm getting goosebumps right now thinking about it. For me, it's Arc 3, then Arc 4, then Arc 1, because Elsa versus Reinhardt, I have a bias with that episode, then Arc 2. That's a relative comparison. And even if Arc 2 is at the bottom relative to the other arcs, they are all such good godlike fucking story compositions like every arc is so fucking good the royal selection and the whale hunt so with subaru now a full-fledged member of the amelia camp he decides to accompany them to the royal capital where all candidates of the royal selection are finally introduced to us Marcus. there's the honorable valkyrie krush the great businesswoman anastasia honorable valkyrie really i didn't know that was her title introduced to us there's the Honorable Valkyrie Krush. All right. The great business. I wonder if Krush at this point has a curse, right? Because the future that Amelia sees in season two, Krush talks about a curse and kind of implies that she can overcome the curse as well. But uh, there's something going on with Krush there. Valkyrie Krush, the great businesswoman Anastasia, the Sun Princess and Bloody Bride Priscilla, then Sun Princess? Bloody Bride? Asia, the Sun Princess and Bloody Bride Priscilla, 
Sun Princess, Bloody Bride. Bloody because <laughs> her virginity got deflowered on the night of their br bride? Or, or the fact that she kills her husband? Like a spider? Don't like spiders or some sort of insect like the praying mantis. Don't they like kill their husbands when they're like mating? I, I don't know, but Bloody Bride, huh? I wonder if she... Has she been married? Has she, has she killed her husband? I don't know. Uh, then the former thief and slumdog felt. Nah. Former thief, slumdog? The former thief and slumdog. Former thief and uh, slumdog? I want you guys to pay very close attention to felt hair color, her eye color, and her teeth shape. Blonde, red-eyed, with the fang, are the characteristics only found in the Lugunican royal family. Felt? is the lost princess who got kidnapped many years ago and Ramji is in on it and the Astrias may know something of it because Ramji talks about that to Reinhardt in like an extra scene. Ascend bloody bride Priscilla, then the former thief and slumdog felt. Each have their own personal knights too who- Yeah, and how are we gonna beat this guy, bro? <laughs> I don't know how it's possible to beat Felt's camp. Who through one way or another, Subaru also becomes acquainted with. The one who takes the spotlight here, though, is Julius and the rivalry he creates with Subaru. You see, after sticking up for Amelia and calling himself her knight, Subaru had unknowingly insulted everyone present who was a knight. Bro, as Giguk said, you're literally white knighting harder than actual white knights. <laughs> what are you doing? In front of these white knights, you're white knighting even harder! Back then, it was a mistake, right? This is a fucking stupid mistake. Subaru's like pride and envy. His wrath was too much and... He just insulted Julius in the knights and Julius gave him multiple chances to back out. Julius had did nothing wrong. Of her knight, Subaru had unknowingly insulted everyone present who was a knight. It was Julius who then stepped up to put Subaru in his place, mm -hmm. but Subaru's pride wouldn't allow that. That's right. No. He instead by doubled sins. down on everything he was saying, digging deeper the hole both himself and Amelia were sitting in. Yep. This is where Subaru's insecurities come to the forefront, since despite knowing he'd never win in a duel, Subaru challenges Julius anyway. And Julius, bro, just... Again, he sacrificed his career to be the villain here, to kind of like take the heat off of Subaru. Like, Julius did nothing wrong. He was the most respectful person, such a gentleman, truly a knight. For winning a duel, Subaru challenges Julius anyway. He's then humiliated exactly how you'd expect, setting in motion a perpetual downward spiral of pain and misery. And here, there was a very interesting line from Julius that kind of goes against what you may think of Subaru. And there's this line of, you truly have no pride when Subaru threw like pocket sand at Julius. And at that point, you would think, Subaru has no pride, but he's such a prideful person. Well, that pride in context most likely refers to a knight's chivalry, like a knight's pride or honor. But it also kind of shows that maybe someone as prideful as Subaru, uh, when he like abandons his pride, it's not necessarily a good thing. And sometimes he's just like, they're delving further into like a different set of sins. Downward spiral of pain and misery. You see, after acting out of impulse and embarrassing both himself and Amelia, the damage done had caused Amelia to cut ties with him. And at this point is when I realized that like ReZero is different. Up until this part, I've never seen a main character in Isekai make this face before. Every main character in Isekai is just this perfect person who just gets away with everything and there's little to no consequences and everything is fine and dandy. For sure, it's fun sometimes, right? Especially, especially if those Isekais are more chill comedy animes. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? But to have a main character like this just fall to this depth and show this kind of face, it's unreal. And a lot of people drop the show at this point because of that. But it's just like, damn, you monkeys truly don't deserve this content. Like such great writing, such phenomenal story writing. The capability of an author to have the balls to show their main character in this sort of light and then to build them back up and hit triumphant moments you've never seen before. The average retard watching this cannot appreciate ReZero. And I don't think I'm even being like an elite gatekeeper. I think that I'm pretty much a monkey myself, but I can recognize greatness when it's there. And most people watching ReZero getting pissed off at this point, it's just like, what do you want? You want just a perfect guy just doing perfect things every time? That shit gets boring real quick. The reason ReZero is so interesting is not because of OP moments, but because of what it takes to get there. Image done had caused Amelia to cut ties with him. It's from here Subaru starts to unravel both mentally and emotionally, 
leading to this growing sense of self-loathing as he's left behind in the capital. And then the best part, or the worst part, oh, we not hit rock bottom yet. A couple more episodes, and it's so difficult to watch, but at the same time, it's just so fascinating how... Never seen an isekai where it, it just... It's, it's like this where the main, I'm actively wishing the worst on the main character until he hits rock bottom that I'm rooting for him again. Fast forward through some sword training with Wilhelm, a few discussions with Krush about the royal selection, then one glorious lap pillow with Rem, and that's when we get to the next set of deaths for Subaru. It was after Rem sensed trouble and Krush reported suspicious activity that Subaru decided he would go back to the manor regardless of Amelia's wishes. What awaited him there was nothing good though, as the slaughter of everyone had already happened. Subaru then freezes to death, is kidnapped, mentally tortured, then frozen to death again. Episode 15, man. It might be the best anime episode ever? I don't know. I haven't seen every anime, but it might be the best isekai episode I've ever seen. Like, this episode 15 went fucking crazy. And now every anime studio, I'm not sure if... This is the beginning, but they definitely popularized it where head gets cut off, credits start rolling down, and it's just like, what the hell? Peak cinema. Now, with Story recently this season, right, with Story of Wand and, oh, uh, Wand and Sword, they did a similar thing where peak action happens and credits start rolling. I don't think this is like a unique thing to Reezer episode 15, but like, it's just so hyped, that format. <laughs> Proceeds to seek out help from each of the other candidates, humiliated by all of them, then commits to doing things solo. It's this time he encounters the White Whale, though, who erases Rem from existence and leaves Subaru to get picked up by the Amelia camp. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, they're still alive in this loop, but not for long as everything that's been happening finally pushes Subaru to reveal return by death. Such a choice kills Amelia right on the spot. Why, though? Because Satala didn't want that secret to be shared with anyone else. She's also showing that, like, if you fuck around, you know, I'll do this. I told you, I, I, I've been, like, grasping your heart before, you know, and now you are being a bad boy? Spot, forcing Subaru to restart by any means necessary. So, after begging Beatrice then Betelgeuse to kill him, it's Puck who freezes him to death for a third time. This is where- And at that point, right, at that point, Subaru also gets possessed by Betelgeuse's spirit as he starts laughing. I always knew there was something so off about that laugh and how to sound like Betelgeuse, but that already hinted at, you know, what's going to happen in episode 23 as we realize that even if we kill all, you know, Betelgeuse in the fingers, Subaru himself is very qualified for the possession. time. This is where Subaru reaches his maximum breaking point so far and decides, you know, maybe Rem is good enough for him. It leads to the best episode of anime I've ever watched, and the- Rem is good enough for Subaru? I know it's a joke. I think that at this point, like, I, I think that Rem deserves better. That, that's, that's my take on this episode. It's that Subaru rejecting Rem is totally fine. Just because Rem acts a certain way doesn't mean she's entitled to love. That's not how it works. But at the same time, it's just like, damn, girl, I wish that you would pursue your own love. I wish you would have your own pieces of pie rather than just being a fucking cuck queen and watching Subaru and Amelia get together. But it's like, ah, damn. But at the end of the day, who am I to fucking self-insert myself as Rem and talk on behalf of this fictional 2D character and what love is supposed to be? But if I, I just feel like any quote-unquote normal girl would be like, fuck this shit, I want my own. But if you're content with your hero chasing after the half-elf, go for it. ...watched and the overall redemption of Subaru for the better. He may have just done Rem dirty, but the support she provided was enough to set Subaru back on track again. So, Subaru's then able to broker a deal with Krush and Anastasia, setting in motion a plan which would help all three of them. That's right. This time, he learned from the past mistakes, right? He's learned from Krush about offering mutual benefit when uh, just dealing, negotiating. Why would Krush help you? Why would she sacrifice her own men to go to the fucking mansion? Also, how would we know? How can we even trust you? You're so suspicious. Even if she has that divine protection or blessing that can catch lies, Subaru is way too fucking angry and none of it makes sense. And then Anastasia's part, the whole uh, negotiation thing about understanding what the other side wants, preparing everything before negotiation, and then dangling it in front of them. That's what we did. Everything was planned. Russell Fellows and Anastasia literally waiting outside. They would defeat the White Whale, then proceed to wipe out Metalgeuse. And this is the craziest part. I think that anime-only people have no fucking understanding of the significance of these events because to you, so much time has passed if you count all the timelines. But right now, this 
idiot that made a fool of himself at the Royal of Capital has just subjugated the White Whale that the previous Source Saint died from, apparently, right? That they could not even do. And then, Betrigius and Regulus are the two most active uh, Witch Cult members, and he just subjugated another one. These feats are actual miracles being performed by the Jesus Christ Subaru. The first major diplomatic move Subaru would make in this world. He likely didn't realize it at the time, but his role in all this would cement his position within the political landscape. Like, other neighboring nations are talking about these events. Something insane is happening. And the craziest part is that these are during crazy political times where just before the arrival of Jesus Christ Subaru, the royal family quote-unquote died out due to some sort of virus that only targets them, which I might think is Pandora gaslighting. I'm not completely sure, but that's what we're supposed to believe right now. And like, again, just... Random dude shows up when the entire royal family is gone and people are fucking uh, trying to figure out what are we going to do? We need a new person to rule this, you know, who's going to be our next monarch? And this guy's performing miracles. Like, it is absolutely mind-blowing, like, how other people should be perceiving Natsuki Subaru. And therefore, he should have a statue in the middle of the town just going like this. It had earned the Amelia faction several new allies as well as saved them from their imminent demise against the witch's cult. It had also improved Amelia's reputation by association, since who wouldn't be happy with someone who helped to defeat one of the great mob beasts? Exactly, and remember, their source saint in the past, Teresa von Austria, quote unquote, died while doing it, so this is fucking crazy. And the craziest shit is, not even like, and, and then like a week after, right? The great rabbit gets subjugated. What the fuck? This guy is on a generational run right now? Everyone should be in utter shock and thinking, are we witnessing a miracle? Helped to defeat one of the great mob beasts. In any case, the battle with the whale had highlighted Wilhelm's tragic past while the rest- Yeah, and this motherfucker never told his wife that he loved her. Wilhelm's tragic past never. while the rest went towards Subaru's redemption. Subaru did meet one hiccup along- This is the another- I, I, I love this end. Episode 23, this ending- was so heroic, so tragic, but I loved it. It's just like, ugh, for the first time, Subaru actually is selfless. So far, he's being selfish by trying to seem selfless, right? He's always putting on a selfless act, acting as if I'm trying to help you, but at the end of the day, he was trying to help himself, right? But in this run, it's like everything of that was pretty much corrected, and he realizes at the very end, something is off. Aya gets expelled from his body because Betelgeuse's soul has possessed his and then he realizes he needs to get the fuck out of here because if he doesn't then everything is run is ruined and it's just like damn we made it this far we made it this far and it's such a tragic loss and not only that it's also cool because you know he starts talking like Betrigusumani Conti which he is at that point being possessed and all the mannerisms and how I always wanted a Subaru to join the cult because of his Affinity to the witch's scent. The way, but that just helped to make sure they could take out Betelgeuse for good in the next loop. A joint endeavor Julius and Subaru took on together. Necked. Eventually, Subaru's involvement is revealed to Amelia, leading to the big climax where he- Wonder how much Nect can be used in different erotic fanfictions. Because they're basically sharing senses, right? Subaru's eyes were Yulis' eye when he closed it. Let's think about Phantom Jackoff. Could we somehow stimulate this or that using Nect? Like if Subaru is like doing this, but suddenly he feels it here due to- Is that possible? Probably. I'll have to ask Tape that. Eventually, Subaru's involvement is revealed to Amelia, leading to the big climax where he finally gets to help her. That's right. It's after that his feelings and loyalty are both made clear, finishing off the season with their emotional reunion. But in this conversation, the number 2000 was mentioned, which is one of the most suspicious, weird things ever, because that's the number of exactly half, you know, double of the shadows required to slay Puck, right? That's what Puck said to Betrigus at that point. Why does Subaru specifically mention 2000 here? Because I feel like, again, Subaru and Satala were lovers in some, at some point, but all that memory's got to kind of be erased. And now the subconscious is bringing out... And the craziest thing is in the web novel, which is not the light novel, which is, again... Source material is mainly the light novel, but in the Shadow Garden moment, 
you know, after the explosion, before leading up to this lap pillow, Subaru was literally talking to like an idealized version of himself where he has seemingly those memories of Santala, right? This is real. But web comic, web cup, web, uh, web comic, web, like web novel. So the number 2000 leaking out, it just feels like a subconscious memory just leaking out these details. Just very odd. Amelia isn't yet ready to reciprocate those feelings, but she is open and happy to receive them, laying the groundwork for a more intimate relationship to be built next season. That's right, the kiss. Before we can talk are about made. that, though. Babies are made like this. There's a few key events from this season that you're going to want to know for season three. Okay. Obviously, the royal selection is the biggest since this is, after all, the main ongoing plot point. And remember, just think about the perspective of all these people and how they perceive Subaru. Within a week, White Whale and Betrigus Romani Conti has been defeated by Subaru in Amelia's camp. Her resume looks fucking amazing. So, aside from Amelia being a candidate herself, we'll be seeing a lot more from all the other factions. Is Priscilla gonna do something, bro? Like, Anastasia was a shrewd businesswoman, and she got the best of everybody else out of the white subject, white will subjugation, right? Krush kinda got fucked, but Anastasia still helped. Krush helped. <laughs> Priscilla ain't doing shit. <laughs> and, she, and, and none of them really showed up in season two, because, you know, it was all about Amelia's development. So season three, you know? Priscilla, I, I expect you to put in some fucking work and for me to glaze you because I want like Priscilla body up first time I saw her, I was like she's hot as fuck, but after that it's just like she's just a cold ruthless bitch, man. <laughs> There's nothing really good about her other than her looks. But it's because we haven't had her develop yet. In season three, I hope that she's gonna shine. There's Anastasia, the one bringing them all together, making us wonder what it is that she wants from them. I mean, with her flair for business and manipulative tendencies, it's more than likely whatever it is she's planning has her come out on top. Are we talking about season 3 content right now? Herself, we'll be seeing a lot more from all the other factions. Yeah. There's Anastasia, the one bringing them all together, making- Does she know that her place is gonna get under attack? Like, this is Pristella or something, right? Neighboring nation right with Karadagi and Lugunika? What if Anastasia? Baited all the other candidates in without telling them what's going on, fully aware that they're going to be under attack by somebody. I could see Anastasia doing that. For sure I could see her doing that. They're making us wonder what it is that she wants from them. I mean, with her flair for business and manipulative tendencies, it's more than likely whatever it is she's planning has her come out on top. Okay. She's supported by the mercenary group. The craziest conspiracy theory is that Anastasia take this battle. I don't know. I'm gonna assume that it's a witch's cult that we're fighting, right? Regulus kind of shows up. <laughs> Anastasia intentionally paid off the witch's cult and whoever the evil faction is that we're fighting against in season 3 and then baited all the other candidates to show up so that she can get rid of all these people and come out on top. Maybe I'm thinking a little bit too mean, but uh, why not? The Iron Fang and her motive for ruling is simply out of greed. One second, guys. Uh, and we're back. The Iron Fang and her motive for ruling is simply out of greed. Next is Subaru's closest ally, Krush, but her incident in Season 2 has left her at a disadvantage. Where she was once a frontrunner for her noble and pragmatic attitude, the loss of her memories yeah. makes her far less threatening. Her faction is still quite strong, what with Wilhelm, Wilhelm Felix, and a sizable military force. And I, I think a lot of people kind of underestimate Felix because of Felix's... I don't know, Felix isn't really that hype in the anime. But when I hear the cut content stuff about how important Felix is, how important a water magic user, the healer, and how they have a whole separate, like, mentorship program where, like, super strong healers, you know, scouts, potential good healers to raise them up. Like, Felix is really important. And now we have, you know, Wilhelm as well, the sword of demon. But that alone isn't enough to get what she wants. It's kind of irrelevant now that she lost her memories, but her motive before was to make Lugunica more independent. That's she right. envisions a no covenant, right? The people for ourselves. Fuck the dragon, fuck the covenant, which I'm actually down for. Nation that can fight for itself. Priscilla's a candidate more shrouded in mystery, since while her arrogant attitude makes her seem hedonistic at first, she basically says the entire world is designed for her and she'll, she'll always be advantageous and. 
if you will listen to the lines that was shown in season two in the third trial for Amelia in the future, the disaster that's yet to come, Priscilla says, see, I win again. I wonder if that's like a divine protection or a blessing of how that works. There's also a very interesting scene leading up to the scene in this specific episode where Subaru is in the streets thinking about how he's going to get into the castle. And he calls for a taxi and immediately Priscilla shows up, her dragon cart. Don't you think that's a little bit too convenient? Don't you think that that's a little bit too advantageous for Priscilla? Is this her divine protection at work or is that supposed to be a funny slice of life moment? I have no clue. To me, it seems like there's an additional layer beneath that. I can't quite pinpoint what it is, but the belief in her own superiority makes her by far the most confident candidate. It just sounds like her divine protection is just bullshit luck. Or is it just truly confidence and she's talking out her ass? I don't know, I feel like... I don't know, man. She just, she just, we'll have to find out more in season three. She's supported by her attendant, Al, and her goal is to make everyone- Who is this kid? I've never seen this kid before, though. Serve her. If they do, then anything they want will be granted to them. Finally, we have the last minute addition, Felt, who Anarchy. with the backing of what's pretty much God himself, probably has the strongest faction out of everyone. Anarchy. She's also supported by the people of the lower class, too. Come, fu fun fact. Completely fun fact, these two girls, their uncle is the APA salesman. Yeah. Yeah. These two perp- the pinker- the lollies that Reinhardt also keeps in his dungeon cell of lollies. R uh, something- uh, Kadomin Rish. Ka Kadoman? I forget the APA guy's name. Kado something, Kadoman Rish, but they're, they're his uncle. He, he's their uncle. Making her the most disruptive candidate. Her goal is to flip the whole hierarchy on its head and completely reverse the current political situation. Whether she has the pull necessary will be interesting to see, but what's more intriguing is how conflict will be resolved when Reinhardt's involved. What's even more interesting is how the lost princess of Lugunica, remember, Felt is a Lugunican princess. She has to be. All her traits are identical, and it matches with the kidnapping in the past. But it's funny how a Lugunican royal is now saying down with the kingdom, right? There's some sort of like irony there. Political situation. Whether she has the pull necessary will be interesting to see, but what's more intriguing is how conflict will be resolved when Reinhardt's involved. You see, with him now being present for season three, I can't imagine there's a threat strong enough to challenge him. Nah, 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 nah. never forget this. Never forget how Nagatsuki Tape introduced Reinhardt in the most epic way possible in Season 1, Episode 3, then refused to show him ever again actually helping out. Yes, we see him sometimes in different scenes, but he's never in a fucking combat again due to other bullshit reasons, and I guarantee you, he's gonna do everything possible to nerf this motherfucker so we don't get bailed out. That's why people like Roswell, Puck, Reinhardt never is there when we need them in Season 1, and yes, there are lore reasons. There's lore accurate reasons on why they're busy, but Tape himself has created these restraints. And same thing with Biko. Biko and Subaru, their new powers, Biko's used up all her fucking mana. She can't do that shit again with Al, you know, Al Shamak, right? Like the Minya shit, like that's gone. So Tape, again, he always introduces new powers, hypes it up, but it's just conveniently never there when we actually need it. I am not going to expect Reinhardt's going to do anything in season three. And even if he does, there's going to be such a convenient way to nerf him. Like in Jujutsu Kaisen, right? How Gojo gets sealed away, like in the Shibuya incident. It's not really a spoiler. It is, I guess, whatever. Like, like, for sure, there's gonna be some bullshit reason to separate Reinhardt from the pack so that we don't just get bailed out, boy. Because if we do, then what's the purpose of ReZero, right? There's no struggle. What's the, if you're just gonna have almighty beings just, like, solve the fucking war? That's not fun, right? But at the same time, it's so frustrating that these OP characters are always just so fucking conveniently gone and nerfed when we need them the most. Imagine there's a threat strong enough to challenge him. That's getting more into speculation territory though, so for now we can just move on to the other key events. There's actually not too many others from Season 1, but if you like Wilhelm then we'll be seeing a lot more of him too. Wilhelm! But yeah, that's a recap of ReZero Season 1, and a bit of insight on how it'll relate to Season 3. What does this scene... like, I feel like there's supposed to be some sort of symbolism here, right? Because Subaru is a sage candidate, Sage Flugel, Flugel's tree here, busted, white whale down, 
but I can't really figure out what the symbolism is here. I'm reaching too much at this point. I'm just like seeing the scene and something about Sage, Flugel, and Subaru in the tree, but the tree is gone, man. Wonder if Flugel is fucking crying. Oh, so there was some sort of Japanese words on the tree, right? Was there Japanese letters? I'm not sure. Overthrown Flugel? Maybe that this is supposed to like resemble that Subaru is the newest generation Sage, right? And it surpassed Flugel by cutting down the tree. Maybe. 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 Flugel was here, was, ri was written on the tree in Japanese. Is Flugel a Japanese person? Was that Hoshin of the Wilderness? Because Hoshin of the Wilderness is another, you know, Isekai character from Japan. Al is also an Isekai character, but I don't know. Something interesting to think about. The video for Season 2 will come out in a few days, so if you want to see that or more videos on Season 3, then feel free to subscribe because I'll be making them weekly. Yes, sir. Please go give Mr. Any News a like on the video. Here's the link. Check out his channel if you haven't. If you enjoy cut content, there's many of it. I'm sure he's going to pump out even more. And yes, this is just Season 1 recap. Season 2 recap will probably land in a couple hours, I would imagine, because ReZero Season 3 is going to air from the time of recording right now, probably within about six hours. But that's it for me. I'll see you next time.